chapter 5, verse 42, the need for evangelism. It says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray your Holy Spirit will lead us as we dig into your word for guidance and understanding, Father. Um, we seek knowledge and pray that you would help us to apply that knowledge into our lives. That we would better bless your holy name through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So I'm pretty convinced that in these desperate days there's nothing more important really uh, that needs to be more worldly, uh, widely scattered than the knowledge of the name of Jesus Christ right now. Amen? Scriptural, the New Testament is constantly telling us to evangelize. And it's really an important thing that we, we do that, especially the local church. We, we, we're in a time right now where we have the social distancing and whatnot. So how do we go about spreading the gospel? Well, we can use the internet. Everybody says that the internet is a tool of the devil, but we have used it as a tool for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. Because of what we're putting out there. It's important. You're still going to see people. You're still going to be close enough to be able to talk to people, even with social distancing. Even with your mask on. And it's important that, especially today, that this happens. You know, we can't just give mental agreement to the message and lip service to the message of God. We actually have to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be Christian people, Christ-like. We're supposed to be making an example. And the spirit of the living God dwells within us. He doesn't want us to just simply be quiet. We're given a great opportunity at this time, if nothing else, to grow in our relationship with God while we're at home. If you can't be out and about, you could be studying the Word and getting into a really good relationship with the Lord right now. And we should all be doing that. Families need it. We're, there, there, there's no passion in the Holy Spirit it energizes us and it entreats us and really wants us to, to have a pulsating heart, to, to have a passion to evangelize. And it's something that's needed. So look at the, the growing population it cries for evangelism. These are the challenges. There are so many people in the world and it's constantly growing and growing and growing. And after this quarantine, this is going to be like another baby boom. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But there are millions of sin shackled, death walking, hell bound souls all over the place. And if we can't reach them with the gospel and give them an opportunity, that's exactly what's going to happen to them. They're, going to, they're hell bound now. They're just going to go there. Separation from God. A lot of people don't like to talk about hell, but it was a place that was created for the devil and his angels, and all the adversaries of God are going to join them. It's plain and it's simple. They, they're unreached. So many people unreached. They're unsaved. They're unsought. They're unloved by Christian people, the church. The church does not do what it's supposed to be doing anymore. It doesn't evangelize. It's, it's not seeking after the people. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. See, God came down in the flesh, and that's exactly what he did. He came to seek and to save. We become the bride of Christ. We're the church. We are the born-again believers, and we're commissioned to teach people the word of God. This verse that we said that we read, it says they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ, yet the church goes silent. The people of the church go silent. They, they're not seeking after the people who are lost and what happens to them when they die. Yes, there are a lot of people who might not believe, but has anybody talked to these unbelievers and shown them the love of God? Because the Holy Spirit works that in that unbelief and changes. Everybody? No. Not everybody, unfortunately. But you don't 
know who it's going to be. So our job is to be out there doing these kind of things because if we're not, it's shown that we really could care less. The unrestrained, unbridled, uninhabited immorality of our nation shows the need for evangelism. We live in, in, in such a, a place where there's just so much horrific things that go on in this nation and in the world for that matter. And a lot of Christian people just keep quiet to it. It's like we're afraid to stand on godly principles because what may affect if we if we don't. So many people are afraid of, oh, these people might not like me anymore and I'm not going to have so many friends if I make my stand and so what? Isn't it, isn't it true that Jesus said that nobody's left their family and their mothers and their fathers and their friends and to actually follow after Christ? He said that. Why? Because I'm afraid that if I stand on the principle and stand against abortion publicly, people are going to hate me and all of a sudden I'm not going to have so many friends. Oh well. We live in such a place where there's millions of abortions. $500 million a year or more is spent in pornography. That's ridiculous. What do the Christian people say about it? The whole everything's good movement, the homosexual movement, lesbianism, and the transgenderism, and I have I have a right to sex change, and, and you should have to pay for it. Kind of, I'm not paying for but they want to take away the rights that we do have and make it so that we have to follow and accept everything because if we don't, we're hateful. I don't hate anybody. But that don't mean I have to, I have to support everything that everybody does. I stand on the word of God and people don't like that, but that's what I do because I'm a born again Christian. I'm going to do the best I can to follow what God says to do. So I'm going to preach the word of God to people. And whether they like it or not, I'm going to stand on the principles that God has because the world is, it needs evangelism. Crimes and crime rates continually go up and the people who are committing them are getting younger and younger and younger and there's booze all over the place, free sex everywhere. There's a drug epidemic that's unbelievable, but all of these things get shunned. And especially right now with coronavirus, nothing else is ever talked about. You know, what about the FBI breaking into that, going into that guy's house in Virginia two weeks ago? How many people even know about that? Somebody said, somebody said that he was doing something. They went in there and shot him while he was asleep with his wife. And they found one gun in his closet, and that was it. When his wife and children came out to protest against it, they were threatened from jail time if they didn't stop. The neighbor also was threatened with jail time if they said anything about it. Why? Because that's the world we're living in today. Immorality, even in law enforcement. And you have to be careful, but you have to stand on what's right and fight against stuff like that. Because that's the nation that we're coming into, a nation that turns against God and, and accepts all the evil and pushes out all the good. The Bible says it's going to happen, and you can see it happening every single day, more and more and more and more. And a lot of these like celebrities, they, they have to put in their two cents, and they're trying to get everybody to follow with them. Well, just because you're, you're filthy rich don't mean anything. You don't live in the real world. Probably, a lot of them probably never did live in the real world. They live in this make-believe world where, where where they just grew up with so much money they, they don't get touched by a lot of the infirmities. It's just wrong. The fact of the matter is, is just because somebody else says it's all right does not mean that it is. Find it up to the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. People need to be evangelized 
or they're going to go in the way of the world. And the way of the world is crooked and it's perverse, my friend. And it's sad. The dead spiritual state of America and the world for that money, for that matter, is it, sheltered to Sunday schools and to churches to evangelize. It's so neat. People have been taught about socialism like it's the greatest thing in the world. And perhaps a, demo, a democratic type of a socialism? Eh, we have so many socialized programs in this country right now, you probably wouldn't even know the difference. But true socialism? See, it almost feels like that's what we're being prepped for, standing in the bread line, keeping your distances. What we're being prepped for is a one world government that the Bible says is going to happen with a one world economic system and that mark of the beast that's going to come around. This is just like the, the beginning opening of, hey, this is coming around and let's prepare everybody for it. Let's get them to do what we tell them they can and cannot do and get them in line. And it's going throughout the whole world, not just here. So you can see, how is it going to stop? When is it going to stop? How do they know who gets tested for corona or who don't get tested? They can't keep track of all that. They're going to have to put some kind of a chip in you like they've been saying that they have. It's only a matter of time, my friend. The spiritual dead state is it's the doom, the damn, the undone condition of sinners. It should be calling for you to go out there and, and evangelize because so many people are being led astray from the word of God. Even Christian people who just walking away from their faith and living like everybody else. And it's, it's a horrible thing. Use this opportunity to get closer to God so that you can teach the word of God. You can preach to the people. You see, these people in Acts, they were daily in the temple and in every house. They went around and they taught Jesus Christ and they preached in his name. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. People are not going to be saved if we're not teaching them or telling them the necessity of salvation and how they can secure an eternal life. The chiefest compelling and, and all-consuming uncontradictable challenge are the commands, the calls, and the commission of the Savior. It's all there. We are told, go out there and preach the Word of God. Now, I'm going to turn to the book of Ezekiel real quick. And I'm going to read in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse number 18. Listen to what the Bible is saying here. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, or speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Huh. That means if you're not warning them of what's going on, you're not telling them their soul is headed for hell and that they need salvation, that they're going to die and they're going to go there, but you're required to answer for why didn't you say anything? They're going there because you didn't open your mouth. That's a pretty sobering thought, isn't it? We need to be careful. We need to be out there. We need to be doing the work that's supposed to be done. Back in the book of Acts in chapter 20, I'm going to read verse 20 and 21. This is the Apostle Paul speaking now. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greek, the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was out there doing that work. Why? So that as he could go on in verse number 26 to say, therefore I take you to, re to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. 
For I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of God, or all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which hath purchased which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul was all about preaching Jesus Christ. And he said, hey, I taught, I showed for three years, I taught everybody here. So I'm not accountable to anybody's blood. Can we say that? How many of us preach to our, and, and, and give our children opportunity? Hey, we can't hound them. But we have to present. What about your neighbor? What about your neighbor's neighbor? What about people you don't even know? Our job is to give warning. Only God can save the soul, but it's our job to plant the seed or water the seed that was planted. That's our job. Not to just kick back and say, well, you know, I can't do that today because coronavirus. That's just not right. We all have internet access. Start using it to present Jesus Christ. Whether through song or through your words. Well, I don't know how to do that. Just put John 3.16 out there and explain it. There you go. Evangelize. We all have to be a part of it. It's our job. And and I don't know about you, but I don't want to be held accountable if I'm standing there when final judgment comes at the white throne and these people are going to hell and, and looking at me saying, why didn't you tell me? And I'm trying to hide that blood-stained hand on my white robes. It's not really going to be something to look forward to. So we have to be involved. We have to be prepared. We have to get ready. We are to warn them. The mandates that we have. Let's take a look at some of those mandates from our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Luke, chapter 14, verse number 23. And the Lord said unto his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. We are told to go out into the highways and the byways to, to bid them to come to Jesus Christ. They're invited. Jesus and God will forgive anyone who will repent. That's good news, my friend. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Son of God, died on a cross so that he could take your sin away and present his blood a sacrifice to the Father so that you can get into heaven. And we're not even sharing that? Shame on us. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse number 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. We are to be fruitful. We are to go out. He chose us. He's ordained us. He's given us the ability to speak about him. The Holy Spirit of God gives us that ability to go and bring forth fruit. If you're not going and bringing forth fruit, what are you doing? You're going to wither and die. 
What good is an orange tree that don't grow oranges? It's not a whole lot good for anything. But if it's growing oranges, man, you want to take care of that so they get big, nice, juicy oranges. But the Holy Spirit do His work and be a part of that ministry, man. You should be planted in the Word of God enough to where you can present it to somebody. And if you don't know how to practice with your wife or your kids, practice. Practice using the sword for the benefit of a lost and dying people. Because without them, they're doomed. Now, we're also told in chapter 20, because a lot of people, oh, I need to wait. It's not, it's not the right time. John chapter 20, and in verse number 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. He's sending you right now, my friend, right now. Because the harvest right now is white and red. Look out there. People are ready. And in a time of calamity like what we're in, more people are apt to actually listen to what you have to say. Because you're not lying to them. We shouldn't be lying to them, speaking the truth. Acts chapter 1, and verse number 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That power of the Holy Spirit of God that's come upon you, that's come into you, is compelling you. Go out and teach and preach and be a witness of Jesus Christ. Somebody had to witness to you. You need to be doing these things. It's important. Let's hear and obey. So there needs to be a renewed vision. That's right, I'm only on the second point of my message. A renewed vision. Proverbs chapter 29. And, uh, verse number 18. Proverbs 29, 18. Oy, oy, oy. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And he that keepeth the law happy is he. This is the prayer. Lord, give us new vision. Father, we pray that you would give us vision. Give your church vision to go out there and minister and, and be witnesses for you, Lord, we pray. Father, it's important. And, and I'm going to tell you, man, the generation right now is running wild in this world, in civilization, in churches, Christianity, Everything has become vanity. Why? Because there's no vision. We've lost the vision. The church has lost its vision. We've walked away from its first love, which is Jesus Christ. We need to be out there doing the work. It's not just the liberals anymore, my friend. Good Bible-preaching churches are changing. They're not standing on the Word of God anymore. They're compromising. They're willing to compromise the Word of God for the favor of people. Shame on every single one. I will not preach against sin because I don't want people to leave the church. I'm going to preach against sin and pray that the Lord brings more people into the church. These people need salvation. They're not going to get salvation and repent of their sin if I don't preach against their sin or tell them that they're in sin. Everybody goes to heaven now. And not all good dogs go to heaven either. That's just a, a, a satanic rumor that has been made up. And it's not true. I gotta tell you something. We need to make sure we're doing what's right, not be a lukewarm church or a dead church that is going to be held guilty and full of spots. Matthew. Chapter 9, and verse number 36. The 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. My friend, we need to be the people as Jesus did. We need to see these people. They're crushed. They're conquered by sin. They're condemned. They're consigned to hell. They need a shepherd. And do you believe that hell awaits these lost souls? Do you believe it? Because if you do, we ought to be compassionate, man. Where is the vision? Have a vision of, of what that's going to be like for those people. And, and it should draw you to want to warn them. It's sad. I have people that, that are friends of mine that if they don't repent, they're going to go to hell. And it bothers me. And I preach to them and I teach them and I show compassion towards them. And they're beginning to listen. I only pray that they repent before the Lord takes them home. Because if he takes them, they're not going to home. Not a home that they're going to enjoy. Because not everybody's going there. How criminal are we as Christians if we keep a blind eye to those in the world? To know what's right and not do it. To know that we need to speak up and not speak up, is that not criminal? I think it is. How sad for each and every one of us if we're not wanting souls. Now, I'm going to go back to the book of John, chapter 4, and verse number 35. And again, Jesus is speaking. Say not ye that there are four months, or that, excuse me, I'm going to repeat that. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What are we waiting on? Are we going to keep silent? Are we going to keep turning a, a, a blind eye to what's going on around us, to the people around us? Are we going to just let them perish and, and not give them warning? We are a body, soul, and spirit, man. We, we, we are more than just what this flesh shows. And it's our job as Christians to, to let people know, man, you need, you need salvation. And it's our job, and it should be a heartfelt burden, to want to be that type of a witness to people. <clears throat> Not in a pious way, thinking that you're better than everybody else. Because I know people who try to witness to people and they think that they're better than everybody else. And they, they, it's just wrong. You're not better. We're all sinners. For all have sinned come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So don't talk to people like you're pious and you're above them. Because you're not. The time is now. The cords of rekindling compassion are now, my friend. Romans chapter 9 and verse number 3. And I, I know this is a long message today, but praise God for long messages. Amen? <laughs> so unless you're hungry and you want to go eat, then you can wait. Romans 9, chapter, uh, Romans 9, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. There's Paul right there showing compassion. He said that he wished that he could take their place. Instead of sending these people to hell, Lord, bring them to heaven and send me to hell instead. I wish I could take their place. But I can't. Why can't he? Because his compassion for Christ. Because he's a born again Christian. He's not going to walk away from God for everybody else, but he's going to bring 
Jesus Christ said that. And I find that place all the while. That you should have that type of a compassion, man, instead of sending that person to hell, I'd rather go to hell instead. <clears throat> that takes commitment right there, my friend. Because I'm going to be honest with you, with the description I read in hell, I don't want to go there, and I don't really believe that I want to take anybody's place that's going there. But I will give them the word of God. And I will pray for them and teach them. Amen. Because we need to have that type of compassion. When, when Christ saw sinners, he was moved with compassion. When, when he looked on to Jerusalem, the Bible says, and he wept. And when he was carrying that cross and the woman was crying, he said, don't weep for me. He was crying for the people. He suffered for the people. And, and that's what we need to be all about doing, winning the wicked to Christ. I have some more verses we're going to be looking up. I'm going to go to Matthew 23 right now. In, in Matthew 23, verse number 37, right, verse number 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou hast killed the prophets and stoned them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens on her wings, and ye would not. People of the world, the Lord will forgive you, but you don't want it. Why? He said how, in, instead of killing the prophets, instead of killing the people, listen to what they say. God will forgive. He wants you a part of his family, and you would not. Our country was a Christian country, and it is not anymore. Yes, there are still a lot of Christians here, but they just keep their mouths closed. So we accept everybody and everything. We don't even want to say one nation and a God. We get rid of prayer in the schools. But we let other religions pray in schools. How does that make sense? We don't have Christmas anymore. They don't sing Christmas songs. They sing holiday songs. We have Xmas instead of Christmas. Why? 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 Why do we have to push him out and then say there is no God? Because you don't want him. And that's not just this country, my friend. This is a worldwide thing. People, he's willing to forgive you if you're willing to repent. So many people, well, I'm not repenting. I don't have to repent. Well, you do have to repent if you want to bring Christ into your life.